Hello, friends. Welcome to Late Night BJ. You're here with me, BJ, Buka Juice, the Buka Man, whatever you want to call me. And we are here to just chat about stuff. Tonight, we are going to chat about... Hmm, what were we going to chat about? Uh, Manila, uh, MIBF, Manila Encounters, and then we're going to transition to what I have been working on for Session Zero, which is Talier Punk. It's still very bare bones, but we'll see. Yeah, if you have been here before, you'd also notice that I have a new camera, and I am not quite used to it yet. I am now. I now have a proper view. A proper view. It's now. I'm now facing straight at it, as opposed to putting it on the side. But I could barely fit in it. There you go. Let's see. I think let's start with an inverted main layout for now. Hello again. Uh, so yeah, you can see me now. And you can see um, our living room. Bianca and my liver, living room. So what are we going to, how are we going to start? As always, when we are having our late night BJs, you should always keep yourself hydrated. I am still on brand. Today I bought a whole box of buco juice, coconut water. And this is what I'm going to drink for the duration. I think this one might exceed an hour because we have a lot of things to talk about. Oh, hey. Hey, Lichcasts. Uh, first time seeing you here, I think. Yes, it's the new camera that I impulse bought. So... It looks nice, and I think I was able to adjust it because one of the problems when I got it is that... Wait, I'm getting some buco juice. Oh, you're on holiday already. Congratulations. I still have a few days to go. I just got off work myself. What was I saying? Well, when I first got the camera, uh, the main problem was that it could capture all of the imperfections of my skin because I have I have atopic dermatitis. That's why I'm always on long sleeves, if you notice. So I have, even on my face, there are some um, discolorations here and there. But I think I was able to hide it properly with lighting. Right, right? I look okay. I also did some magic by adding some coconut oil, VCO, virgin coconut oil, on my face. That actually um, levels the tone, the color of my face. So I think it works. Okay, and now um, let's start by adding some music. I should remember to turn on the desktop audio. Hello, Laila Nihan. Am I saying that right? Okay, turning on desktop audio. And then I found a holiday playlist. A holiday station, rather, here at Pretzel Rock. So that's what we're going to play. Oh no, it's too festive! Hello! Okay. Let's see. That is too loud for me personally, so I'm going to adjust my volume on my... on my headphones. But it shouldn't change on your end. Let me know if it's too loud so I can adjust it, okay? Okay. Um, if you are watching, don't forget to hydrate. Get something to drink. Minus... Buka juice because I am super on brand. Uh, let me drink for a bit. I also have an Aries mug because I am an Aries. So there's the there's that. So what are we going to talk about tonight? Tonight I want to start out with uh, with my haul. I I recently got my haul from the MIBF, the Manila International Book Fair. We used to go every year, but this year it was since it, since we are living in the pandemic, we the MIBF decided to go online and we shop for our books online. It's actually um, a lot less stressful because uh, if I remember the MIBF visits correctly, they can be very intense because there's a lot of people, there's not a lot of space, and you it's very crowded. And I'm not really good with big crowds, especially with people that I don't know. So, it just concluded, but their website is still up if you want to check out what they're all about. This is the Manila International Book Fair. 
Really? I have three MIBF books down here. Uh, Lichcasts is uh, my neighbor. That's why. That's why she said down here. <laughs> I can come and grab it on our next game day. All right. Okay, so that's the Manila International Book um, Online Book Fair. So it's now M I O B F. <laughs> I, I'm I'm pick I'm picking at straws. So I want to talk about what I got. One of the first things that I got is actually I got two copies of Barangay, which is the way I describe Barangay is it's the Visayas the campaign setting. So basically, if you're if you want to learn all about pre-colonial Philippines or very early colonial Philippines because this was um, a lot of the information here was taken from the Boxer Codex which I also have if you want to see it let me know I'll pull it out and the Boxer Codex was written by the Dasmariñases the the governor generals because one of the, our first governor generals was the governor Luis Dasmariñas if I'm not mistaken I'm not a historian so feel free to Feel free to correct me there. Anyway, that's a lot of where Henry William Henry Scott got his um, research. But also, of course, he drew from other sources. But that was his primary source, I think. So, I already actually have this book. Let me show you my original one. So, it's this one. This is the original. It's actually a better cover than the new one. Because the new one feels looks kind of pixelated although i don't think you can see it right now it it feels like they just printed it and they didn't bother to um fix the the resolution of the of their cover images even at the back you can see it when you're trying to read the sp spiel at the back didn't scale the image before printing. Yes, I think that's exactly what they did. So why did I buy more? It's because my current one, this is, I actually refer to this book a lot because I'm also researching a lot of pre-colonial culture, mythologies, um, not just pre-colonial. I'm also looking at colonial culture, post-colonial culture, um, everything that presents Filipino culture, I, for, I consume so that I feel that I'm more knowledgeable or as knowledgeable as it can be I, as I can be without actually going into an MA right so this one so you can tell that it's um, it's been used quite a lot because it's already quite fraying at the edges although the spine is still intact so what's happening here is this one is already going to Pam it's Pam called dibs on this one so I'm going to pass it over to her and then I promised HTT Paladin um, one of our leads in the islands of Sinauna. I promised him a copy, so I'm sending this one over to him. And this, this, this last one, I'm going to keep for myself. Because I want to keep a copy. So that's the first one. Oh, Ragredon. Oh, it's you. Hello. Welcome, welcome. What else? Yeah. I also got this one. I have it read into the other books yet so i can't quite say what they're about but this one is called uh, manila city of islands manila city of islands evokes manila's rhythms colors and sights capturing the city's totality and uniqueness so i joined the asian cyberpunk jam and one of the things that uh oh sorry the setting that i wanted to do is a talier punk a sort of cyberpunk but not quite cyberpunk manila and i feel like i should consume as much about manila in addition to what i already know as a native of manila so this is one of the things that i will read so that's that and then we have the book one of the sugidan um, the sugidanon of panay the epics of panay this is tikum kadlum this is pretty interesting. I act. This is uh, published by UP Press. The first two books were published by Ateneo Press. This one is by UP Press, and I've seen this just before the quarantine started. I've seen the volumes four to eight of this over at UP, and it looks interesting. I've always uh, enjoyed 
reading epics because they have a very interesting pace. It's quite drawn out, but it's also quite um, super heroic in its own way. There's a lot of there's a lot of um, defeating armies by yourself and courting gods or being courted by a god. So they're always fun. <laughs> Epics are epic. That's right. Okay, I only have one book there, the Darna book, because one is beams and one is racials. Okay, that's good to know. So I'm going to get into this, but not right now. Maybe I will start reading the epics after the Cyberpunk Jam. So there's that. So what's next? I have here something that is still in its bubble wrap. So let's see what it is. Uh, ha. I decided to open this during the stream. And now I realize the folly of my ways because I should have gotten... A scissor, but I think I have a cutter here. Let's see. An X Acto knife, which is a go to for people who paint miniatures. Uh, that's, one of, that's one of my hobbies. I paint minis. So, actually, say hi to Dato Tanso. This is my bronze dragon. Pretty cool, huh? I can do this now because I have a better camera. Although, I don't think it's focusing. Uh, oh well. I did turn off autofocus. So that's my fault. Bubble wrap. Uh, I'll, probably tr I'll probably try to post a picture of Dato Tanso, the bronze dragon, later. On Twitter? Maybe Twitter. Uh, I have to be careful because X Acto knives are very sharp and I don't want to damage the book. There. I should probably go to manual now. Yeah. Yeah, focus is uh I was re I was watching a few tips and tricks for Twitch earlier. And they say that it's better if you actually turn off autofocus because it will keep on doing the autofocusing while you're speaking and that can get annoying to viewers so at least in this in this way you will be able to see me at least i am focused the whole time so that's really the important thing i think so okay this one is myth myth and writing and occasional prose this is by... What's the publisher of this one? Also UP Press. Okay, let's look at the contents. I actually have no idea. I, I basically judge this by the cover. Because look at that... Um, look at that girl with... I'm pretty sure she's a girl. Because she has... Plenty of... Stuff. <laughs> she has plenty of... <laughs> Can I say... <laughs> Am I gonna be... Am I gonna be kicked out of Twitch? <laughs> stuff. Let's go with stuff. Yeah, yeah. I I've got to edit that in post. Memories. Uh, okay. It's f it's kind of fun, but also, this is an act. I think this is an actual deity from one of the Philippine epics. Um, if I have time later, I could grab the I could grab my soul book and try to look for which deity this was, because this is. This is a goddess that shows up in... I'm not sure if it's Panay. No. It's Visayan. It's one of the Visayan deities. But as you can see, she's a fertility goddess. <clears throat> so let's see. What's it about? I think this is about writing myths. So the literary practice of complexity. Things like that. So it's more of an academic treatment on, as, as far as I understand it, it's an academic treatment on writing myths, which is something that I am quite interested in. It's not related to Asian Cyberpunk Jam, but it will be something that I can use for... for Meilakanjan, which is some, one, another one of my projects. It's a, it's a pre-colonial Philippines from the perspective 
of someone who lives in the 21st century. So, uh, I tried to differentiate it with the Islands of Sinauna, which I contributed to. The Islands of Sinauna has a strong, it has to be honest to the pre-colonial culture. F- to uh, my Mel- The Melakanjan campaign setting, on the other hand, has to be has to be something that a modern Filipino can what's the word can empathize with but also be informed by pre-colonial culture so that's difference that's the, that's the difference Google says Mebuyan oh that's interesting and I don't quite know if that's correct so clearly I need to read this whole book more so that's Myth and Writing with Occasional Prose by J. Neil Garcia and then this one I already opened. This is actually Bianca's, but we both wanted it. She just decided to be the one to buy it. This is Salamanca. Oops, can you see it? Yeah, Salamanca is actually an art book by Ian Santa Maria, who is also the artist for Sky World. I'm not sure if you follow Philippine comics. Let's see. I really like this. There's a picture here of Darna or well it's it's a character that is strongly inspired by Darna. Let's see if I can find her. Anyway, maybe I should just show you the pages. It's really pretty. Oh, it's an art book. The Girl on Fire. I think this one is a volcano goddess. Possibly. Pretty good, pretty good. The Datu's the spirit daughter. The white Datu. Aha! The white Datu. It's actually Datu Puti, which is um, one of the mythological figures of pre-colonial Philippines around 12th century, if I'm not mistaken. It's not 100% sure if he actually existed, but he was a Datu who was Caucasian. <laughs> so, how, how did he end up in the Philippines? We don't know. But he was called, yeah, Datu Puti. The Warrior's Way. And yes, of course, if you cook and you're in the and you're from Manila, then you would know that Datu Puti is a brand of vinegar. The, the darn of picture is really nice, but I can't quite spot it at the moment. Oh well. He might have been albino, but it's also debated if he actually existed. He might not have existed at all. Uh, let me fix this. It is in danger of falling down. <laughs> so let's... I, we also have Salamanca Part 2, which I won't open because as I mentioned earlier, this is Bianca's books. So Bianca's books, I'll... Uh, let her have the opportunity to open them. And now here, I have a big pack. I'm wondering if I should open this one because there are four books here and two of them are mine. <laughs> and two of them are Bianca's. Let's open them. Let's see, X-Acto knife. Be careful when dealing with X-Acto knives because they are super sharp. Like they can cut, they can cut some of my metal miniatures, so they're not sharp. There we go. So I won't pull, I won't pull out the bubble wrap too much, so that Bianca has the opportunity to enjoy the bubble wrap. That to put you as a legend in the way Mang Thomas is, uh, I suppose. The condiment gods. It's actually funny because one of the books that Bianca got is My Tik Tik Sa Bubong, My Sigbin Sa Silong, which is a Tagalog book that is um, an alternate treatment of Aswangs. But the fi- uh, what, what's funny about it is that I have the book right there. So we now have doubles. So I guess we can write on one or something. Let's pull out my books. First one is Tales from the Southern Kingdom. 
So, Dr. Virginia Villanueva is of mixed heritage, born of a Muslim mother and a Christian father. With a medical degree from the University of the Philippines, she sailed for Sulu with her husband, another doctor, and their children. They lived in the heart of the Muslim community in Holo, and later among her royal relatives in Patikul. Patikul? Patikul. I'm not sure. For more than 30 years, she absorbed the stories about her family, mostly historical and some tales and legends from her mother and many patients, the Tausog from Sulu and the Sama from Tawi-Tawi. So, as a person from Luzon, I read a lot about the tales of Mindanao. And Mindanao has a very rich culture because unlike Luzon and Visayas, they have not been conquered by the Spaniards. Things got more complicated when the, when the Americans came. And also, we have a complicated relationship with them now. And by we, I mean we, the people of Luzon and the people of Visayas versus the people of Mindanao. But they have a very rich culture because they have absorbed Muslim culture but have localized it. So it's not going to, it's not going to feel like the Islam of, of the Middle East, for example. It will probably be closer to the Islam of Malaysia and the Islam of Indonesia. And I think there's at least one royal family remaining. Instead of Norms, you have Nor. <laughs> cool. The Norse. So, I read a lot about them, but also I cannot be an authority on them. Because while I am Filipino like they are, their lived experiences is very different from the lived experience of someone who lives in Metro Manila. So I try to uh, appreciate the culture, but I cannot, I try not to write about them. This is, actually, this is something that has come up because someone has asked me to do a sensitivity read on a Mindanao based culture. I can't quite do that, unfortunately. <laughs> or I can, but the disclaimer is I'm Tagalog. I'm not I'm not from Sulu. I'm not from I'm not Maranao. I'm I'm glad that you you all are still excited about that Puti in the pantheon of Mang Tomas. <laughs> the silver swan. <laughs> okay. Let's see. The other one is body and sexuality. I don't quite wow, the cover's nice. It has this texture on her on it. That's um it's especially after touching the barangay reprint. This one has a very um text it's an actual texture. It's not going to it's not going to show on video, but it has a it has what's the term for this? Edges? But anyway, it's good. It's good to hold. So this collection of essays is a fruit of the 2004 Conference of the Ecclesia of Women in Asia, or EWA, a forum of Catholic women doing theology in Asia. So it's body and sexuality, but informed by Catholic practice. This path-breaking publication by Catholic women theologians in Asia calls attention to issues that make many people uncomfortable, but which need to be integrated in the, uh, in the consciousness since they are part of human reality. Ah, uh, I'm looking forward to digesting this. Very interesting. So this is body and sexuality. So a bunch of essays. So the others are from the others are Bim's books. So uh, we're not gonna talk about them too much. So I think that's my haul. Yeah. So in addition to that, I actually. My Amazon order just arrived, and I, I, I really want to show this off. So we, we're we're going back to RPGs now. This is Neverland. Whoops, so hard to angle it. Neverland. It's a fantasy role playing setting. This is actually five E compatible. So pretty cool, pretty cool. It, it has this gilded leaf cover that evokes the feel of a storybook. And while it says 5e compatible, it's actually very rules light. It's in the tradition of old school Renaissance or OSR games. So 
uh, if you're going to look at the stat blocks, they are simplified. Oh, can you see? Ooh, I can't put it onto focus. I'm sorry. Which is just as well because you should buy it. It's a very good book. It's focusing on hex scrolls and the premise here is um, it's set several decades after the Darlings, Wendy, is it Michael and John? Wendy, Michael and John. Sure, 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 Regretan. Wendy, Michael, I think it's Wendy, Michael and John. Um, it's se several decades after they arrived. But since they were not transferred to Neverland via elf magic, they were brought there by Peter Pan. Basically, they he, he flew her, he flew them willingly into Neverland. They actually are not part of the Lost Boys who do not grow old. They grow old. So Wendy has become a hag. And the, I, I want to talk about the others, but it's going to be spoilers. So if you're interested in this, just grab it. It's a hex scroll setting, so you will, you will be exploring the island. And there are various regions that suggest reasons why you would want, or your character would want to go to Neverland. And there are also rules here that change depending on whether you're a child or an adult. That's fun. So that's Neverland. And... I think those are the books that I want to wanted to show everyone. Yeah, Wendy ends up old, and then but she is still inside Neverland. Unlike Hook, in Hook, she they eventually left, right? Everyone left, and even Peter Pan got old. So those are the books that I wanted to show off, and. Um, it's very, um, what's the word? I had a budget for them that I wanted to spend on because it's Christmas and I wanted to get books for myself. It's one of the things that make me happy. But also, I wanted to have new references for the things that I'm writing. And I do think I'm going to write quite a bit in the coming months. Although that is also tempered by my professional need to take more actuarial exams. So it's a balance of sorts. Anyway, I'm not quite as well known in my, with my writing, I guess, because I'm not as prolific as some of the other RPG SEA designers who are much faster at writing stuff than I am. Uh, this is not a dig. Uh, this is um, this is actually um, I'm rooting for them. They're... They have, they have a lot of works that showcase the unique perspective of RPG SEA. And I am quite happy with my own base. I need to drink. <clears throat> but I'm saying that I have, I have a slower pace because full-time job, I'm in my 30s, I have other responsibilities, uh, which isn't to say that they don't have responsibilities. I'm digging a grave here, am I? <laughs> okay, I need to drink. Okay, at any rate, I'm happy with my own base, and I think that's what matters, right? I don't have to force myself to work in the same rate as the others because that's not something that I'm comfortable with. As long as I'm comfortable with my own pace, then that's what matters. All right. Hmm. What's our... Oh, hello, Potato Dialogues. Hi. It's Christmas by Danny. Are you okay with the Christmas theme? Um... This should be okay, I think. But if you're, but if you don't like it, I can move to like synth wave or something else. What's next? Oh yeah, I want to talk about Manila Encounters because when I was, I, as I mentioned earlier, 
I wanted to do career punk versus an Asian cyberpunk jam. But one of the interesting parallels or sorry differences from how cyberpunk is treated in the West and how cyberpunk happens here is that it can still be magical. I, I suppose there's a there's an element of shadow run to it. But there's still magic alongside technology and they actually in many ways interact with each other. A lot of modern magic stories set in the Philippines or set in Manila specifically still employ technology, still employ um, texting or using your phone to cast spells, things like that. And it's normal because I suppose we are a supernatural culture yes <laughs> okay so why am i talking about this it's because when i was trying to start writing for the asian cyberpunk jam i remembered uh, manila encounters which is something that you could get in my itch so go to bukojuice.itch.io and look for the manila encounters when i wrote the manila encounters no I did not write the Manila Encounters. I compiled the Manila Encounters. But when I started the Manila Encounters trend, I just wanted to do something that is very akin to OSR. I wanted to collect a bunch of random encounters for a setting that uses Manila and all the magic that we believe Manila to have. So that's how Manila Encounters started. And then they're... they're tweets so they're micro fictions so it's a hashtag actually let me just type the hashtag real quick although it's filled with a lot of um, different things now if you check Manila encounters now on Twitter so it's not quite it's not quite the same as it used to be but when when I started that it was in February 2019 and I left I left a few encounters so that there are samples to start with and then asked my friends to do it and then they did it Pam and Jami and Sin and then their friends did it and then it kind of did a domino effect and suddenly it went viral so it actually evolved from a random encounter table to something that is more akin to a horror microfiction which is cool in its own right because i think in our society horror and fantasy are two sides of the same coin like we understand that magic exists but at the same time we are afraid of it so that's why horror and fantasy are kind of like the same almost in filipino stories so I collected, I collected the ones that really fit into my original idea of the Manila Encounters as a random encounter for RPGs. And I collated them all in a PDF. So let's open it up. Pa-pow. Then let's change our format so that you can see it more properly. Then let's change it to two-page crawling. And there, wow. So Manila Encounters. Uh, let's check some some of the entries here. These are all taken from contributors with their permission. So this is also why it's under a CC CC Share Alike 4.0 international license. So while I do charge for the PDF. What you're paying for is not my writing, but the layout and the presentation. And also, if you don't have cash and you want a copy of the Manila Encounters, all you have to do is find me and PM me, and I will be cool with giving you a copy. That's pretty basic, right? So in addition to the actual Manila Encounters, which starts at page 42, I also asked some of my, some people 
on Twitter to help me out by adding some ideas of their own. So, Reina Bambao, if I'm not mistaken. Let's, let's make sure I got the name right. Yeah, Reina Bambao uses cheap goods and steep prices to transform the stresses and excitement that is Manila shopping into a D&D dilemma. So, she translated the, the popular shopping districts of Manila into um, D&D markets, specifically D&D, because she, she translated things to gold pieces and to magic items that exist in D&D. So, it's interesting. And then, Phil, Phil Corpus, decides, decided to go with an Intramuros Miscellany, which is basically... The same format as Manila Encounters, but set in 1890s. So set in the Spanish colonial era. So if you want to do if you want to do that time period, you could also do it with this with this PDF. Then Jammy has wrote about the in-between spaces, which comes from the sisters tree. So who are they? Are they related to the Titas of Manila? So and finally we have the actual Manila Encounters, courtesy of Twitter. Let's see. Let's look at some entries. What do you want to start with? So we have trees and tree dwellers. The way I the way I arrange these is not alphabetical. It's just instead it's things that are slightly related are in close proximity to each other. So for example, uh, encantos can be tree dwellers, so they are close to the tree dwellers. The reason why it's written this way is because Filipino mythological creatures, Filipino fantas fantastical creatures, defy the categories of Western mythological taxonomy. So, your your tree folk can be a fae, she can be a god, or they can be they can be just a random spirit, or they can be ghosts. So, encantos are related to diwata, which are godlike beings almost which then translations to the Santo Nino and the little gods which are also divinities then you have schools because when I thought of little gods or Santo Ninos rather I thought of how often you would see them in schools and then from schools schools are filled with ghosts then from ghosts you go to other haunted places and then since we're talking about haunted places, specifically there is a there are a lot of stories that are related to children and how they are sacrificed as part of construction sites to make sure that the construction is, is sturdy. So we're not sure if that actually happens, but it's a pervasive myth. And then Manila itself, and then trinkets from Manila, and then doppelgangers, and then off the bay, the Manila Bay itself and the river. So, which do you want to look at? Um, no Matter What is by Wabe. It's a feature article about writing in jams, in game jams. So, let's see. What do you want to look at? I kind of want to look at Little Gods for now because I think this one only has two entries. So, oh, actually, huh, it has eight. I was mistaken. It's been a while since I, uh, since I read these. It's the Santo Nino that only has two entries. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the, this is the format. When ev for every entry, I wrote an intro and then some examples. And then whoever the contributor is, is also credited. So, let's start with the Santo Nino. So, the little brother. These are all tweets, so they are going to be in the size of tweets. So, little brother, one day, a woman living next door in our condo frantically told me, that my little brother is going in and out of our room, walking along the corridors every night. I told her I live alone and I don't have a brother, but I do have a Santo Nino statue in my room. So it's funny because um, the Santo Nino is actually representative of the baby Jesus, right? So, but the baby Jesus is one of the creepiest statues around. And I like this art by Christina, Christina Marcos. Or as she as she likes to credit credit herself here in this particular work, she is Christina, not related Marcos, for obvious reasons. So I like this because the halo is a CD-ROM, and he's all um, 
the Santo Nino is holding a pen tablet. Ah, uh, sorry, a, tam- a tablet pen rather, and a internal storage device, inter- inter- internal storage drive. What do you call that? Did I, did I call that correctly? And then the Santo Nino of the stylus. So if you need someone's phone hexed, there's this tool at the mobile chunge, a flash drive. No, it's not a flash drive. It's the smaller one, um, SD card. It's called an SD card, right? If you need someone's phone hex, there's this stall at the mobile changge. You'll know it by the Santo Nino idol bearing a stylus and SD card. See, Phil actually already spells it out for us. Whose eyes glitter like shattered DVDs and whose robes are gilt with polished micro sims. So, you can see that Manila has that element where you combine both the... Aha, uh-huh, suddenly, re- suddenly recognizing that I did not press record. Anyway, that's a minor problem that I can fix with a download. What I was saying is that Manila has this quality that mixes the folk Catholicism of the Philippines with modern tech. It's also why I think that the game Demon, The Descent, is very well suited to a Philippine setting. Because there's this there's this element of the divine and the technological mixing together to this um, pseudo horror setting. So little gods, I like the gods of Kubao. The the Kubao gods are minuscule. They fit in your pocket and whisper things in your ear. They are sometimes helpful, but mostly they just want to go home to where the earth is soft and fresh flowers are not made of plastic. Anywhere but the malls, essentially. I think this one is Sin? Sounds like a Sin thing. Oh, it's by Stella. So Sin is not... Oh, there you go. Sin did the moss-covered guardian. So, I say small, but the moss-covered guardian is actually fairly large. There's a funny moss-covered guardian that likes to hang around by the UP Diliman Freshie Walk. It's a, it's a walkway that Freshies use freshmen if you have ever felt lost as a freshman around campus they say that this entity likes to whisper subtle directions in your ear so the way i see it the moss covered garden is kind of like a large entity a large elemental thing so it's fun what else we can also look at i kind of like the Um, Encanto. Encanto are fun. So here. So there are 10 entries. So the way the way this works is that if you want, if you are playing in a setting, uh, sorry, if you're playing in a Manila, fantastical Manila setting, and you're out of ideas, you can look at this source book, or zine, if you want to call it that, and roll on a relevant table and then add that element to your game and then it's up to you really on how you're going to add that so for example let's roll a d10 mm. Mm, where's my d10 i have a d20 10 d10 d10 so just roll a d20 and then divide it by two Ga. I rolled a 10, divide by 2, that's a 5. So let's go with... Ah, oh, it's mine! Client meeting! So I'm out of ideas. I, I roll on the table all for Encanto and I got client meeting. And it says, just got home from that Encanto client meeting. They say human pets have been easier to get ever since we marketed black rice's antioxidant and iron-rich properties. Glad I helped the client, but damn, I'm never eating that thing. So this is actually a callback to how black rice is supposed to be the, the the preferred food of the Encantos and how it's actually very it's actually an adaptation of a western motif wherein you're not supposed to eat when you are inside fairy and this is an adaptation of that and it became rice and I suppose black rice is mysterious so that's why it became it Develop that quality. But also, black rice is good. 
I I like I I like the taste of black rice and its iron rich properties. But yeah, if someone else offers you black rice, make sure you know that person. <laughs> because otherwise, you might be trapped in you might be trapped by the encantos in their realm forever. So not something that you'd want to do, right? Let's see. So where are we now? So why is this? Why are we looking at this? Why are we looking at the Manila encounters? It's because in in a way, it has contributed to the growth of the RPG SEA hashtag. We actually started RPG SEA in late 2018. I think 2018 or is it 2017? Let's go with 2018 for now, and then I'll just correct it in post if I were if I was mistaken. Actually, there's a way to do that. I can just open pukojuicegames.blogspot.com. Pow! This is my blog, by the way. You can check out some of my ideas here. Then let's look for let's look for an RPG SEA hashtag. Beer gods. Beer gods should have an RPG SEA hashtag. Uh, there you go. RPG SEA. And then let's look for the earliest entries. All their posts. Ah, it's closer to 2017. Yeah. There you go. The first one is October 3, 2017. So we launched it at around that time. But by 2019, it's actually it was actually a very slow, slow moving hashtag. We just kept on using it even if it wasn't really picking up a lot of steam. And what happened at around February 2019? Was it 2019? Yes, I think so. What happened at around that time was I started the Manila Encounters hashtag and then it went viral and then when it went viral um, our friends from Malaysia started the KL hash uh, KL Encounters hashtag so let me type that down that is um, hashtag KL Encounters which is the same and uh, the same idea essentially except it was situated in Kuala Lumpur which is where most of the Malaysian RPG SEA folk are from. Um, Zdeck is not from there. Zdeck is in Port Dickinson. I want to say Port Dickinson, but I could be wrong. And then there was also hashtag SG Encounters for Singapore. And I'm pretty sure there was also hashtag Jakarta Encounters. But this one wasn't a wasn't from the uh, RPG SEA crew. I think this was who started this. I think it was Mia. Could have been Mia. So Jakarta encounters. So it was a set of hashtags that all went for micro fiction horror, and it all went viral in our respective regions in Southeast Asia. And then we were also promoting RPG SEA beside that. And that's how things started to really pick up because the people who contributed to those who also happened to be aspiring RPG designers were able to use that to launch their indie careers. Yeah. I think that's that's a good way of summarizing it. Like Pam started also with uh, a few Manila Encounters posts and then graduated to and she's very prolific now. Right? Same thing with Sin. They have also been they have also contributed here. And I'm really happy that they contributed because I was basically just asking them, "Hey, can you contribute to this?" and then they did and then it blew up because of their participation. I'm really happy about that right so in a sense manila encounters has a connection i wouldn't i wouldn't say that it's the 
it, I, I wouldn't say that it's the one thing that made it go grow, but it's one of the factors that made it grow. And I think, I guess I'm proud of that in, a, in, in my own way, right? Now, where were we? Why is this important? Because now that I'm looking at the Asian Cyberpunk Jam, I'm looking back at the Manila Encounters and seeing where I want to take my work. Because I have been working on something called the Project Talier Punk. And the idea be behind the Project Talier Punk is that it is a mishmash of all of the 90s set in Manila. So it's a combination of 1590s, which is the time of Governor General Luis Dasmariñas, as I mentioned earlier. And it is also the 1890s, around the time of Jose Rizal, and when the Katipunan was being found by Andres Bonifacio in Tondo. And then it is also the 1990s, when Cubao is dominated by large, hand-painted posters of bomba films. And it is also the 2090s where the where money is Bitcoin, called Po, which is the peso sign. And there are going to be arcopolises, arco arcologies. I think it's called an arcology. Those domed structures that basically is an, an ecosystem by themselves that dominate the landscape of urban Metro Manila. So. It's a combination of that and the punk aesthetic of fighting against the power. But also, since it is a Manila setting, even though there's a lot of cyberpunk elements to it, it's also going to be a place where magic still exists. So I'm quite excited at what I can do with that. Don't forget to hydrate. Okay, so what have I been doing for Project Talier Punk? Hmm, let's see. Mostly I have been on the brainstorming. I have been on the brainstorming stage still. Ah, uh, thank you, Ragredon. Right, can you see that? We can just zoom in a little bit. So my current idea is that I want to work on the old school essentials as my base. So it's going to be based on the very earliest editions of D&D, but I'm going to change some of the premises. I'm not sure if you've uh, if you've all played uh, B BX or the White Box or anything before the AD&D sets. experience points i think in old school games are gained by earning money or rather by loot that's why dnd has roots in looting looting ancient tombs getting treasure using that treasure to carouse because that used to be the major way to gain xp Right. Uh, if I remember correctly, um, old school games, old school games, had a system where one GP, one GP, if you bring home one GP, that is going to be equivalent to, excuse me, one XP. So, if you need one thousand XP to level up, then you have to have one. Uh, then you have to spend. You have to spend 1,000 gold pieces. So I kind of want to subvert that a little. So in Project Talier Punk, in Talier Punk, what I plan to do is to have one po, which is peso. Wait, let's see. Peso symbol. I'm going to show you my forbidden technique. Ah, copy. One peso. No! Delete that. Change that to Arial Black. 
I got black. There. So one peso given to your family equals one XP. It's not this is not peso. Huh? This is a um, my current idea is to call it the peso. Hmm. Let's just copy that one. The P, the P with the two bars, is called the Po. This is the idea that I have right now. Oh, oh yeah, you, you have mentioned that you haven't played RPGs before. Yes, actually, if you go to 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons, a lot of the XP is going to be based on monsters you kill. And that is also part of the D&D tradition. Let's see, playing the game. Let's see if we can find experience points. Monsters. Running adventures. Running the game. Experience points, experience points. Awarding XP. Here you go. So, here you go. Treasure that PCs bring back from an adventure is the primary means by which they gain XP, usually accounting for three-fourths of the total XP earned. Because non-magical treasure, characters gain one experience point per one gold piece value of the treasure, and magical treasure does not grant XP. But there's also the defeated monsters, and take note, old school D&D is around the uh, 1970s. That's when it that's when it came out, and consequently, when RP, computer based RPGs came out, and they used monsters as the measuring stick for earning XP, that was also an idea that was taken from D and D itself. So because there is also XP awards for defeated monsters, but note here that in this old school setting, it's actually not that high. Because, for example, a 4-hit die monster gives you 75 HD, uh, sorry, XP, but it's... Uh, good night! See you around. So, to continue what I was saying, 75 XP, that's not a lot of XP, but a 4-hit die monster is a powerful monster already, especially if you're level 1, level 2. It's going to be a challenging threat so what happened more was that old school DD preferred to rob the monsters and then run away from them because they're pretty strong and so it became it became a thieves game and then Later editions of D&D realized that and gave more importance to monsters. So they changed this up. I think in 5th edition, a CR1 monster is worth 100 XP. So look at that. That was a... That's a... Times 10. Uh, the, 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 it's a factor of 10. The increase of XP awarded from defeating monsters. So if you play 5th edition D&D now... The XP that you gain is mostly going to be from defeating, from combat. And that's also why later editions of DD have a focus on creating characters that are built for fighting, just like computer RPGs. So it's interesting because I think that influence came from computer RPGs, who took the system itself from early DD. So it's a cycle in its own way. So going back to what I was saying, my idea is you, your character is going to be uh, expected to have a family. Your family can be act your actual blood family or it could be your group. So if you are if you are coming from something like Blades in the Dark, it's going to be your crew. So you give them money, it's not going to be yours. It's going to be something that you give away for them to use. And then it to better their own lives. And so giving away one po will be equal to one XP. But how much is one po? How much is one po? 
or in Tagalog, isang po, which has been constru- con- contracted over time into the word sampu. So, how much is this? If we are talking about the 1590s, one po is an abstraction because the economy hasn't been solidified yet by the colonizers. So, one po is roughly enough to feed yourself for a day. Or a day. If if you are lo- thinking about the 1890s, I believe one po can translate roughly to actually one peso. Although I could be wrong there. Could be one real. Needs more research. But what I can say is that in the 1990s, one po then becomes 100 pesos. Because because it is is three meals. Three meals, 30 pesos each, and then 10 pesos for commuting. So, I think this is an interesting um, an analogy. So, this is not going to be in the game because the 20, 2020 economy it, it does not exist in a setting that is a Mis- mismatch oh sorry mishmash of different 90s so 2020 is just for demonstrative purposes only demonstrative purposes only and in this case one po is actually closer to 500 pesos of today money But I think the most important part for this case is the 2090s. In the 2090s, one po goes back to the archaic use for it, which is closer close to pulo, puno. One po or one puno is one full, one large. So by the 2090s, they stopped using the peso as a currency. And instead, they uh, they went to the puo system. One large is enough to feed you for a day, and this is actually a digital currency. Digital currency, which if you are going to translate, if translated to peso, is roughly ten thousand pesos. So, I like this because this also shows like a, a, a sort of inflation. But the question is, is Talier Punk set in the 1590s, the 1890s, the 1990s, or the 2090s? The answer is yes. <laughs> but which, but BJ, which 90s is this game set on? The answer is yes. <laughs> so you have here 2090s tech with Bonifacio running around causing trouble and starting the revolution in order to overthrow Governor General Luis Das Marinas <laughs> while they are all studying in UP. So that's the idea of the Talier Punk. And the po'o itself is going to be like a digicoin, a bitcoin, roughly. And I, I, I like, I like this, um, I like this currency thing. So that's one idea that I have for Project Talier Punk. I'm going to change the idea of getting treasure as experience to handing treasure down to your family making sure that you give them one po 
so that they can so that that person can eat for the day and then get uh, that that translates to exactly one xp but that is only part of the issue because even though you have even though you gave them one peso or one po that's just enough for them to eat they will still want phones they will want clothes they will want tuition so i will i guess i can imagine tuition is going to be let's see tuition i would say 10 10 30 question is like 300 oh. per sim <laughs> so there's actually a problem because minimum wage guess what the minimum wage is it's one peso <laughs> so if you're just working and then you only have like 22.5 working days per month actually 22.5 already assumes that you're you're in a job that gives you leave benefits it's actually just 20 working days per month but there are 30 days in a month So how are you going to feed your family if you are only earning your minimum wage? And this is why you're going to have rackets or your side gigs. And this is where the adventuring comes from. Because you have to make ends meet. You have to you have to give away your money to your family so that they can exist as they depend on you. Oh, good night, potato dialogues. As they depend on you. But at the same time, that puts yourself in danger. But that's also what gives you XP. So, I think as a core aspect, this has potential to be a very interesting OSR system. I'm not sure though. Let me know if I'm... If I'm rambling or if this has... If, or if this is going somewhere interesting. Hmm. What do you think? So there. That is my... That is my current idea for... Project Talier Punk. Which will be my entry to the Asian Cyberpunk Jam. It will all revolve around that economy. And around that need. To feed everyone. And of course, when you... So interestingly, since I'm using the old school essentials as a base, when you get to the higher levels, you get like... Instead of getting like a stronghold, you get like gangs that you could like put into service to do specific things. And I like how that in, that's an interesting end game, in my opinion. So that's where I'm going with this, I think. And speaking of Talier Punk... You should check Public Utility Mechs by Pam and Sin. There you go. So here you have transforming public utility vehicles. So Public Utility Mechs. So the Public Utility Mech program was a nationwide government project that was established during the hard years. Its goal was to enable the populace to fend for themselves by subsidizing the costs of building transformable robotic battle frames. The only requirement to join the program was that the potential pilot was a driver registered with the land transport with the LTO. After completing a crash course in piloting, pilots were handed a freedom drive, given some basic parts and a bit of cash, and a map to government-run scrapyards, and set forth with God's blessing. It's, um, it also evokes that feel, but this one has a very mech idea to it which also is interesting ah, i like the art that they used it's um uh, optimus prime with a backdrop of a jeepney optimus jeep ah freedom is the right of all sentient beings 
So check it out. I believe they do community copies, but all copies are currently claimed. If you buy one, though, you will put another community copy onto the market. So I think this is a good... I think this uses a combination of... It's a Sword Dream product is what it is. It's It has an OSR idea that is helped by PBTA elements. So I would really like uh, uh, I would really like to like recommend this for you guys if you are interested in more Talier Punk ideas outside of my own. So there. That is my progress progress report for Project Talier Punk which I am trying to rush out so that there's a workable beta by the session 0 con. And I think with that, I will end this session of Late Night BJs because we have gone over an hour. This has been the longest BJ sessions yet. Uh, Late Night BJ sessions yet, rather. So thank you. Thank you for showing up, for watching the stream. I really appreciate it and for interacting with me on chat. And I will see you next week same time ah before that by the way um we're going to go back to aninag which is our sina una streaming game eh, which runs every saturday from 1 to 4 p.m on filipino time which is gmt plus 8 okay i think they just captured an aswang and it's going to be an interesting jumping off point from that anyway that's been it Thank you for drinking bubble juice with me and good night.